Hi, everyone. Welcome to our daily homeroom. For those of y'all who are wondering what this is, uh, this is something that we started many months ago. It was really when all of us had to be socially distanced around COVID. Uh, but it's, it's really evolved into, uh, you know, an outlet to having interesting conversations uh, and for us to interact with all of y'all uh, as we go through the conversation. I'm very excited about our guest today. Uh, Feel free to ask questions on Facebook and YouTube in the message boards. I have team members who are looking at it, and we will try to surface uh, as many questions as possible. But before we begin our conversation, I will give my standard announcement, reminder uh, to everyone that Khan Academy is a not-for-profit, uh, that we exist because of philanthropic donations from folks like yourself. If you're in a position to do so, please think about donating. A special shout out to several corporations that stepped up. Uh, as especially as the COVID crisis was ramping up and our servers, uh, our, our traffic was two, f two, 250%, 300% of normal registrations going through the roof. We're trying to accelerate a bunch of programs, especially thanks to Bank of America, Google.org, AT&T, Fastly, and Novartis. Uh, but I will remind everyone, including any corporations out there listening, that we continue to run into deficit. Uh, so if you're in a position to help out uh, uh, at any scale, uh, please think about it. With that, I am super excited of uh, introducing our guest, uh, who is someone that I've always admired, and I've I'd, I'd like to believe have become a, a good friend over over the last several years, uh, Francis Ford Coppola. Francis, thanks thanks so much for joining us. It's my pleasure to join you. So Thank a you. good place to you know, a good place to start is you know when we scheduled this, uh, the world was already in kind of the COVID crisis and. Uh, you know, I, I thought we were going to talk a lot, and I think we will talk a lot about, you know, learning and especially learning in times of crisis and, you know, what, what is this doing? But obviously, there's been layered on top of COVID other things in the world. Uh, you know, you, you we have uh, the protests and uh, around the, the killing of George Floyd um, around not just the country, the world. I, I would love your view as a storyteller, as a filmmaker, as an observer of the human condition. You know, what's your lens of what you're seeing now and you've you've also seen seen a lot in your in your lifetime you know it, does this have parallels with other things you've seen or is this is this different in certain well, ways well i must say you know i was born in 1939 so so to me the big event as i was growing up as i was a child of four and five and six was world war ii uh so i was born at a time when the world was going through one of the most terrible uh of all bad things, which is a world war. And uh, uh, of course, I was blessed being in America uh, in that we were never attacked as were our uh, fellows in uh, all over the world. And so this, I would say that this present pandemic is the most um, serious crisis that I have personally, uh, as, as a more understanding adult, lived through. and. Uh, you know, all my perspective is that you know the the human species. Uh, it's always it's always easy to say, well, people are are uh, selfish, or there's part of them that's bad, and, and and it always has been. But you know, I don't believe that to be the case. I believe the story of humanity, uh, which has been uh, certainly going on 50,000 years. Recorded history is only maybe 7,000 years old. Uh, but there have been, uh, the, the human species is a latecomer uh, to, to, to the, the, the family of, of creatures that inhabit the earth. And we have changed quite a bit over that time. And, and usually there is some tremendous influence, some innovation or some event uh, that causes a, uh, uh, a readjustment of what life is like. It, 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 it goes way back to the time of, uh, of agriculture when human beings began to cultivate agriculture uh, for the first time and suddenly land became uh, a priority. So there was landowners and then with landowners there were the people who, who worked on the land and that evolved into feudalism. And, and in each phase, phase of human development, there was always a reason why things changed all the way up 
into say modern time with the industrial revolution it was the 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 learning how to make force engines steam engines and and ultimately mass production and that changed everything so so this idea to say that human beings are a certain way for me is is uh, is not true it, it depends on what is going to influence uh, what what uh, what happens, and uh, therefore we can uh, imagine a time when there are other priorities changed by other things, by by uh, our uh, human ingenuity uh, is constantly inventing something that changes this science called economics, which everyone thinks, well, this is the way it is. It's not the way it is. It's ever changing, and so I can imagine definitely. Uh, out of out of even out of this crisis, I I see change. I I don't hear people talking so much about oh uh, I'm worth this much money or I earn that much money. I hear them talking about oh my family's okay, my my family is safe. Uh, so that I think that there has been uh, some some uh, positive things we're learning from uh, from this crisis together. Absolutely, and and what's your sense? You know the the you know just as an observer in, in in our country and maybe around the world but especially in our country around you know what's around race issues you know i think we'd like to believe that there's been progress but there's also you know it feels like every now and then we get reminded as we've been in the last not just last several weeks but last several years that you know th things are still happening that we thought only happened 50 years ago well, where well, do you think I, we are I, on I, that narrative yeah, I feel that, uh, you know, we are all immigrants. Every There is not an American, there is not anyone living on this continent who is not an immigrant. Even the Native Americans came here maybe 15,000 years ago. No, there were no human beings in any part of what we call the New World. So to, to refer to the them as, oh, they're new here, they're not really born here. I, I heard today on television a lady berating some young lady of, well, where, 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 where were you from? Where you're not, this isn't your home. The truth of the matter is everyone in America is an immigrant and the immigrants have been a source of tremendous benefit beyond calculation. That's what, one of the things that gives us such a vitality and innovation. And uh, certainly uh, African-Americans who, who came here, not even, wasn't even their will to come here, they were brought here. Uh, African-Americans are, you know, I'm an Italian-American. Uh, there are Chinese-Americans, there are African-Americans. And African-Americans have struggled uh, unfairly against uh, the, the prejudices that grew up around them during 300 years ago. And when you think about it, it, it will take a, a big effort to change the four areas that 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 is troublesome. One is, of course, uh, the criminal justice system. Two is the, uh, the equal opportunity for equal education. Three is, of course, the health health care and the ability to be healthy. And four, in my opinion, is uh, child care and nutrition because these children have to have good nutrition so they can learn and they can blossom and be uh, the, the, the uh, contributors to our society uh, that, that we know is possible. And, and you say, well, to do that, to really, to really uh, attack those four areas, so, um, uh, criminal justice is an enormous job and health is an enormous job and it's going to cost a great deal of money. But that money has been earned uh, because the African-American contribution to American culture over the last three years has earned trillions of dollars in, in revenue from uh, the, 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 the uh, selling of that culture, which they created, jazz and, and literature and dance and, and so many things that have enriched and have, have enriched uh, our country, uh, uh, certainly a percentage of that is a, as a royalty is worth spending uh, the the needed uh, money that we have to do to to, to uh, revolutionize those areas of, of criminal justice, health education, and uh, child care and nutrition. The money was earned by what they contributed, and they're entitled to that money to be uh, spent in those areas as a royalty. Right. It's a fascinating idea. Uh, money, you know, as you mentioned, contributed over 
you know, 300 years, you know, many, many, many generations. You know, just, you know, one of the things that, that uh, I think we, we like to do on, on this homeroom is for any guests, because we have a lot of young people watching, uh, they're, they're, you know, a stage of their life where they're trying to figure out what to do. They have some things that they're excited about, some things that they might be feeling less secure about. And when they see a Francis Ford Coppola, who's, I mean, I don't think I'm, you know, saying anything that anyone would disagree with, a filmmaking legend, you know, they say, well, how did, how did he become Francis Ford Coppola? Uh, so, so maybe tell us a little bit about your own journey, because I think especially something like filmmaking, you know, you can go to film school, but it doesn't seem as obvious of a career track as, you know, going to med school or law school. How, how did you become that and, and what gave you the confidence and, and did you know, how did you know that you had some of the creative gifts, you know, uh, Ernie H town from YouTube says, thank you, Mr. Coppola for the greatest cinema ever. And I think a lot of people would agree with that. So tell us a little bit about that journey, especially when you were young, you know, uh, talent is Talent is a strange thing, and there's there's two kinds of talent you can have. There's the God-given talent that, you know, we all know those kids. They can just draw beautiful pictures, and they could, and there's no effort to them. Or they can sing, or they can dance, or they've just been given uh, the gift. The other kind of talent, uh, really, you have to work for. And, and one of the beauties of, the, of, of all of these fields is that uh, even if you didn't get, I, I did not get that God-given gift. Uh, uh, I would say the filmmakers like, um, well, Steven Spielberg clearly just has the knack and the, just was given the talent to do, it, plus a lot of work in addition. And there were great directors like William Wyler, who happened to be the nephew of the owner of uh, Columbia Pictures and uh, got the chance to do it, but he had just a gift. In my case, it was, uh, I saw talent all around me. My father was a talented musician, and uh, but, but I didn't feel I was given any special anything except I had enthusiasm and I had a good imagination and I worked hard and, and uh, I just tried and I tried and I tried to write little plays when I was a kid and I knew they were awful, but I didn't stop. So, so whether you get that God-given gift or not, uh, app applying yourself and working hard and having a dream that one day you'll be able to do the thing you love, uh, it does work. I, I have seen actors who I remember from college were terrible, and uh, but they never gave up and they kept trying. And, and years later, they, they started to be actually brilliant, you know. So, so you, can, you, you, can, you can either work your way to what your dream is or you get the natural gift, which sometimes uh, uh, is not even as good as, as uh, those, those of us who have to just keep working at it. Uh, uh, and certainly that's true of writing or any creative thing. I, so I, I was a kid who was extremely good at science and, and, uh, and I knew all, I understood electricity and I could make little gadgets, I could make little electric motors or do things like that. And I wanted to be a nuclear physicist, but I had flunked algebra twice. And my father said, you can't be a nuclear physicist if you're gonna uh, flunk, uh, flunk algebra. And I said, I, my mind, has difficulty. I, unfortunately, I, I looked at the Khan Academy al algebra course and at my own pace, I was able to understand it. I have more of a spatial mind. So I, I won the geometry medal in, in, in school uh, because my mind thinks as whole pictures, doesn't think as a linear thing. So every kid has the things they're good at naturally and the things they're less good at. And the trick is to, to identify uh, what you're good at, and often it's what you love. So I loved science. I wanted to be around science and technology, and unfortunately I was taken out of school for reasons of my father's moving around, and I went to about, I don't know, maybe 20 schools before college, and I would always wander uh, as a new student. I had no friends, and I knew no one, and I wasn't doing well in school. So I would wander, I would, the teacher wouldn't even care if I said, oh, I have to do a special project. I would always wander to the theater department because they always needed boys at that time who would climb up on the stage and hook up the lights. And from up there with the lights, I would watch. And of course, I wanted to go to the theater department because that's where the girls were. 
you know, the girls were either in the theater department or they were at the around the football team. Well, I was sure not going to meet them uh, playing football. So I, 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 I went, they were at least at the theater department and I wanted to, I wanted to meet one if I could, or even get to know one. Uh, so I was there hanging the lights of the theater and I would see the teachers directing the, uh, the actors and I thought, well, I could do that. And so uh, that was really the reason I became a theater major. And ultimately when I did go to college, I was a, a theater student and that's where I sort of blossomed because I was doing something that I really loved, which was to do plays. And then from that, ultimately the transition came and I went to film school. I could tell that story if you're interested of why I chose film school rather than I was going to go to the Yale drama school for my master's degree, but something happened and I went to film school instead. Well, well now you've, you've, I have to ask you, why, why did you go to, I'm curious. Why did you go to well, film I was school? very, I was, I was very poor. I had absolutely no money and, 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 and just to eat was like a major, to have a, a lunch was, you know, a major, uh, uh, thing and so I would hang around uh, where they were building the the new theater because I knew I was going to get to do plays in that theater, and there was a little theater and there was a sign that said today only four o'clock we're showing Sergei Eisenstein's Ten Days That Shook the World, which I had I knew he was a Russian silent film director and and so I had nothing to do and 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 I went in there and there were maybe four people in that little theater and I saw this silent movie by Eisenstein and I couldn't believe my eyes. You see this, this stuff. And it, it, even though there was no, it was no music or anything. It was just a silent film, but you could hear it. You could hear the crowds. You could hear the machine guns. You could hear everything because of the way it was edited. It was the first time that I saw what this magical ability that film has, which we call montage, where you take a shot and put it together with another shot and make something, magical and when i came out of that theater i said i'm not going to the yale drama school i'm going to be a film director like eisenstein and i de and i decided to go to the ucla film school and my whole life was changed and, and that relates to a question from youtube uwu says how can you know not to be too ambitious with your dreams in life was, was there any point where you're thinking maybe i'm you know filmmaking isn't a guaranteed job how am i going to pay the bills will i even be able to make films how did you know you weren't being too ambitious? Yeah, yeah I, I had no money. My father was mad at me because I he had at one point sent me to military school, which I didn't like at all, and I ran away, and he had to pay for it even though I had run away. So he didn't want to support me in college. I had no money. I knew no one in the film business. I had, didn't, didn't have a family connection. I did have the blessing of a creative family. My father was a great musician and I had uncles who were in music. So I had seen uh, in theater that kind of stuff. But, you know, in answer to that uh, young person, you can't be too ambitious. You you are given this unique opportunity to live and, and you should have the c most wild, wonderful ambition you can dream up because anything is possible. I'm a good, I'm a good, uh, example of that because i i was as poor as you can be i lived i lived i remember i had 25 cents for breakfast i had 40 cents for lunch and i could sometimes have uh, for dinner a craft macaroni and cheese dinner which in those days cost about 20 cents so i was really poor and uh i went to the most wonderful film school which was in the university of california ucla which was a uh, you know, I mean, tuition was like $40 a semester or something, so which was a blessing of California at that time. And, and, and they're, they're, I was the least possible person to, to, uh, to get even in the movie business. And, 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 you know, part of me dreamed, of course, that I could do it. But the other part thought, well, maybe I can become an assistant director or something. And because I did have a, a sort of technical ability. So, I mean, every, every person alive is a unique individual one of a kind if, if you're if you're listening to this there isn't anyone like you so the the fact that there's no one like you do what you love because that's telling you what you might be good at and and anyway even if if you're not as good as it is you want to be you're doing something that you love doing that's that's you know they say if you do what you love you never do a day of work in your life 
and it's true. You know, I would do what I do. I, I don't even know. So most of the time, I don't get paid for what I do. I, I, I basically am doing it because I would do it no matter what. And that's what I think I would tell young people. I remember my daughter, Sophia, when she was a young girl, she was a very uh, interesting, little precocious young lady, and she always admired fashion, and she was a good painter. And she was going to painting school, studying painting, and and uh, she said to me once, Daddy, am I just a dilettante? Am I just a girl? I'm going to be studying painting, but I'll never probably be really a great painter. Uh, I like fashion. I like photography. I like stories. Uh, what should I do? And I said, do everything you love. Uh, why? Because if you do what you love, you're going to learn about all the things you love and who knows what you're going to be. In five years, you may decide to be something, but if you were doing the things you loved, I bet you that they will be useful. And then four or five years later, she made a little short film. You can see it on the net. It's called Lick the Star. And she was just uh, with her high school friends. And you could see when you made that, that she was a born movie director and all of her interests, fashion, photography, storytelling, painting, all helped her be a film director. So even if you're not sure what your profession is going to be, uh, still do the things you love because there's no doubt that if you do those things, they will be useful when it finally is clear to you what your profession that you wish is. And then, and, and, and uh, you, you'll have the benefit of all of the things you were interested in. No, that's, that's super powerful. You know, there's a question from Facebook here. Jeannie Nicole says, did you have a person in your life that helped you believe you can do anything you want? It sounded like Sophia had you uh, and, and probably others as a teacher. So uh, Jeannie's a teacher. As a teacher, I strive to make sure I tell each student. So yeah, who, who in your own life and actually maybe who in other people's life have you played that role? Because I know there have been several. Well, well when I, w I was a very bad student, I, I should have defended myself because to my father getting good grades and doing well in school, he had come from a neighborhood in a sort of area in New York where, where the uh, boys either became hoodlums or professional musicians or doctors and lawyers. There was a split. So he, he hated the hoodlum mentality, someone who didn't do well in school. But at the same time, he took me out of school every six months, and I was always in a different school, sometimes even in a far distant area, like I would be going to school in New York, and then suddenly I'm going to junior high school in California. Well, California and New York was as different, more different than any two places on earth is today. I remember being ridiculed in school in New York because I was eating an avocado because people in New York had never seen an avocado. That's how different uh, the, the, it was. So, so my feeling is that, um, you know, once, so I was in, I was not in good with my family. My brother was a brilliant student, and 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 I was a terrible student. But my mother did something good for me. Uh, my father didn't take me too seriously when I said, "Oh, I want to be a director and stuff of plays." But my mother said, "Listen, if you're interested in being a, a director, I'll give you." Uh, enough money that you can go to New York. He, we lived out on the outskirts of New York. I'll let you go to a matinee of a play every week. And so every Wednesday I would go in the subway or whatever the method where, where I was living to the city and I would see a Broadway matinee, you know, which probably cost $8 was a lot of money. But she gave me the money to do that. And I think, uh, you know, that was a wonderful thing, she a gift she gave me. Also in UCLA, uh, I met a uh, professor who was one of the only women uh, movie directors Hollywood ever had. Her name was, uh, it was funny, uh, Dorothy Arzner. And she directed many, many, many uh, big uh, Hollywood films with great stars like Catherine Hepburn and, and uh, Joan Crawford. And, and, and she was a major Hollywood director and the only woman for many years who was. And, 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 and she, she was very encouraging to me. And there was a time I can remember one night I was broke. I was miserable. Uh, I was lonely. I, you know, uh, and, and she came out in, 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 in uh, out of the, the bungalow that where the film school was in UCLA and, 
and she said to me, uh, she said, you know, you'll make it. I've been around a long time and I know you will. And she left and I was ready to quit. Uh, mm. But that little word of this one teacher, uh, I said, wow, she, she was she was a great movie director and if she says that that i i i'm gonna make it god maybe i shouldn't i wanted to quit and go get back to new york and maybe see if i could get a job as a stage manager or something uh but but the, that little voice of encouragement helped me a lot i i think one thing in the second part of your question sal is that american film directors uh have been very good about uh supporting each other and helping each other I mentioned Steve, Steven Spielberg. He has sponsored so many young directors and made it possible for them to have their careers. And even I, in my career, uh, took a, a, a very bright, much younger student who, whom I had met and, and uh, 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 you know, wanted to work with. I thought he was so bright. And, and uh, I said, I'm going to try to help you get to make your first film. And that was George Lucas, who, of course, made Star Wars and American Graffiti and uh, is, uh, you know, is a legend. Uh, but he was the skinny, 16, uh, skinny about, uh, how old was he when I met him? Maybe just 20 or so. Uh, uh, and, and became, you know, at first an assistant, but very qu quickly not an assistant, more of an associate. And uh, and and there have been uh, opportunities to to give a, a helping hand or, or encourage uh, even even the great one of the great all time directors today, probably the greatest uh, living working director, Martin Scorsese, was a, was a kid, a younger director that I that I tried to be helpful to. I remember I got him the job to do uh, the film he made with Ellen Burstyn, Alice Doesn't Live Here Anymore. So uh, uh, it's part of, it's like being a tree. I mean, if you're not planting new young trees around you, there won't be a forest. And what did you see in a young George Lucas or Martin Scorsese? I'm guessing that there were other, I don't know exactly where you were in your career arc, but I'm guessing by that point you were starting to get relatively established or known. What what did you see in them? Probably there were other people who would love mentorship from you. What 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 spark did you see in them that said, yeah, "I think they're going to tell well, them if, something"? If you if you scratch a filmmaker, what comes out is no matter how old they are, no matter uh, you know, if you scratch the skin a little, out pours enthusiasm. To to hear George Lucas talk about film, he would get so excited about. You know, you take that shot and you put that together with that shot, and then you get something that you didn't imagine could happen. There's such an outpouring of, of of love and enthusiasm for the cinema. To this day, Martin Scorsese is the best film teacher I think on earth. You, I would recommend very seriously anyone interested in movies to get a documentary series that uh, Martin made called. Uh, uh, my, my voyage, my Italian, uh, my my Italian voyage, which is a, a multi-set in which he discusses from the beginning to end the Italian cinema and goes into every director and what they did. You come out after seeing that a you know so much about how the cinema uh, evolved and developed, but, but more important, you just want to make a film, and that and that's great. You know, uh, that's what young filmmaker. You know. When I was a young theater student, I had three heroes that I just, I mean, they were like untouchables. It was, of course, uh, Ilya Kazan, it was Marlon Brando and Tennessee Williams. And, and they represented to a the theater student of the 50s, uh, you know, the ultimate. And uh, of course, I was blessed to have uh, been able to, to meet each of, of, of them. Uh, but it's good to have a hero of someone who, if you're a writer of whose books you just admire so much, or if it's a dance, a dancer who inspires you, or a composer, or uh, whoever it is, a songwriter, Carol King, wh whoever it is you love. And it's all right to even imitate them because you can't imitate them. That's the beauty of it. In other words, you could try to write a song like Carol King, but it goes through you and it comes out different. And that's what you want. Uh, I remember once reading a, a note about uh, Balzac, the great French writer, and someone said, oh, the young writers are, 
are taking your writing and they're copying it. And Balzac said, oh, I want them to. I want them to. That's why I do it. Because when they take it, they make it their own. It means I'll live through them forever. And, 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 and this idea that, oh, of course, plagiarism is, is wrong when you, when you take something someone else wrote and say you wrote it. But to be inspired and try to do something like the person who inspires you, whether it's anything, music, film, dance, that's okay because you can't just copy it. In you, you are such a unique a creation yourself that it'll come out differently and little by little you'll start to understand the difference and as it becomes clear to you that becomes your voice and you go on and it becomes more and more beautiful and then some young person will steal from you and you want them to it's there for them that's super powerful and you know one thing that I think it comes through and even just your narrative and what you see in others, but you know, the spark, this curiosity, I, I don't think probably the world fully appreciates just how much you have that in you uh, for context. You know, the first time, I, well, the last time we've seen, we saw each other pre COVID you, you, you said, yeah, I would love to meet, but you've got to teach me calculus. <laughs> Tell us a little <laughs> bit about your, your, your love for learning. I, I, I think you're, you're, you're kind of infectious when you talk about that. Well, that's very important um, because I think if I, could give the, the, the subject of education my two cents, uh, be it the teachers, wonderful teachers, and less wonderful teachers, the students, the wonderful students, the less wonderful students. What I would say to them that I've learned is that the secret to why we want to learn is because it's pleasure. That learning is one of the greatest pleasures you can have. And, 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 and if you, if, if the students could understand that, sure, there's lots of reason you learn because then you'll become more wise and you'll be able to get a profession or you'll be a doctor or you'll make your parents proud or you'll be able to make money, money, uh, all those things. The real reason to want to learn is because the more you learn and learn how to learn, the more pleasure you get. And, and I always had an example. I think I even, oh yeah, I have it here. Why is that true? Uh, you know, because you think of human beings, they were born in the, in, in, in the mud, you know, we, we, we suddenly saw, where, where are we? What is this? Where am I? It's going to get, it's cold. I'm cold. I'm hungry. I better find something to eat. So human beings just ran into a bunch of puzzles that they didn't know the answers to. But because we're gifted with this wonderful ability uh, to think and the tradition to think, and ultimately we learn how to think, uh, that we're able to solve the puzzles, and it's it's a great pleasure to solve puzzles. And I always make this, I have it here. I have this example. I, I, all the kids know this puzzle. This is the two nails that, oh, I got it. yeah, go like that. And, and if you have one of these, you say, well, how do you get these two nails apart? And, and some kids can just figure it out immediately, and others don't. But if someone says, look at the way to do it is you line it up so that uh, let me see how I, I go. Yeah, you line it up so it's like this, and it's pointing up, and then you go like that, and uh, oh, this is gonna work. <laughs> you go, you go like this, <laughs> twist it around. I know how to do this. Wait a second. My whole point is being. Uh, you line them up like that, and then you twist it around like that. Sal, I failed. This shows the learning rate, process. We're all yeah, we're all on well, this journey. I, I, you do it like that, and then you go around like that, or is it around like that? Or no, it's up like the kids are laughing at me because they know how to do it. <laughs> anyway, I'll you 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 put it up like that. Then you take one around. I'm so close. Anyway, it's great pleasure to learn how to solve this puzzle, <laughs> and later I'll do it again. But the, le learning how to do anything is, is my point is it's a pleasure. If I had been able to teach you how to do this stupid puzzle, I would have been happy and it would have given me pleasure. But learning everything is a lot of fun, and, and that's the reason why we, we go to school and we learn is not because of all this, the sub-reasons that they tell us. It's because it's a lot of fun to, to do. 
No, and, and kudos to, to you, Francis, because I think, you know, in real time on on live, I guess, live stream to, to try, it shows, you know, a growth mindset, a, a, not not a fear of failure. And I think we all want to go and try to. You can't have a fear. That. You can't have a fear of failure. If you have a fear of failure, you won't do anything. That's you right. Know, you, failure, and also failure is, is one of the steps of success, because when you learn what not to do, then you don't do that again and you skip that. So that's that's an equal step towards success. If you make a movie that's a bad movie, that doesn't work, that doesn't uh, uplift the audience or engross them, then you think about it a lot and 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 you say, well, the next time I'm not going to I'm not going to make those mistakes. Someone someone tricked this. They made it so I can't do it. I know <laughs> one of my kids one of my kids no doubt. They bent the nails a little bit too much. You know, I I, I, I would be remiss. I'm getting a lot. There's a lot of questions from a lot of film film buffs here, as you could imagine. Uh, you've, you've, okay, you've I'll attracted. try to I'll try to be less talkative, and I'll try. No, to, no, uh, this is wonderful. No, no, I'm I, no. This is and, and keep solving the nail puzzle. You know, I mean, there's a lot of questions about. I mean, people are asking, what's your favorite horror films? People are asking about some of the things that you know Gene Ham from Facebook asks. You know, when Mike Michael Corleone pops a hole in the orange and sucks the juice out of it. And it's kind of a metaphor for how he treats life. You know, is that stuff you came up with? Was it in the script? Was it something the actor came up with? Uh, I'd love, I'd love, you know, uh, quick views on that. Oh, go ahead. Oh, you got it out. Oh, very good. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you know, <laughs> the metaphor of the orange in the Godfather, you know, um, the, the, I basically saw the oranges around. I didn't have an idea of, oh, this could be a symbol of anything. I just said, yeah, take the orange, you know? Or like when I put the cat in Marlon Brando's hand. I, in other words, it seemed to be an opportunity uh, to, uh, to to use what was around. And after a while, then I, when I edited the movie, I, I began to understand that, that the orange said something. A lot of times when you're working on something you're sort of half in a trance and you're doing it because it feels right to you or it seems to be logical. Although I do have a rule when I'm making a film, I always try to know what the overall theme is in one sentence. Like in The Godfather, the theme was succession. In, in Apocalypse Now, the theme was morality. So if I know what the big picture is, when they ask me a lot of questions, of well, you know, a director just answers questions all day. Should she be in a dress or in slacks? Should she have long hair or short hair? Should she drive a sports car or a sedan? And you just say off the top of your head, yeah, long hair, yeah, dress. But when you don't know how to answer it, then I always say, well, what's the theme? And then, for example, the movie I made, The Conversation, they were asking me what kind of coat he should wear. And I said, well, he's really not a detective. So it shouldn't be like a Humphrey Bogart coat. And one of the coats they showed me was a raincoat and was transparent. And I said, well, the theme of the conversation is privacy. So let me give him a transparent raincoat. Sometimes if you don't know the decision, if you ask yourself what the theme is, it will suggest what the decision should be. So there are lots of tricks that you can learn. That's that's super powerful. Well, you know, I, we we and my continue. favorite my favorite horror film of all time. Well, gee, there's a you know when you get to the subject of favorite films, there's always people who come up with oh my ten favorite films. That is so absurd. You could come up with a thousand favorite films because the cinema, which has only existed for 140 years, was blessed with the most wonderful masterpieces. Even in the 30s, when movies were silent, there were already. 10, 20, 30 masterpieces. So uh, when you ask what is your favorite horror film, you could say Nosferatu of Monau, which is a silent film. It's a silent version of a kind of Dracula story. That's a great one. Or you could say Alien. That was unbelievably scary and horrible. Uh, what other, what, there, there are probably four or five really, or you could talk of Japanese films, uh, the film of Mizuguchi, uh, Ugetsu, that's really beautiful. So cinema is so filled with a bounty that you can just enjoy for your whole lifetime seeing the great works that were made. And they tend to make you want to make one too, because uh, it seems like such a wonderful field, the cinema. It's, 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 uh, it's truly one of the, well, all the arts are. And, and I, I, of course, like to encourage young people 
uh, to consider going in the arts because their parents aren't. Their parents are saying, oh, become an accountant or become a lawyer or become a doctor. But partly it's because their parents want them to be able to make a living. And the truth of the matter is the arts is a wonderful way to make a living because what they call today intellectual property, which is when you make a book or you make a painting and, and stuff that that's very valuable because it's such a beautiful thing. Uh, so I think young people should consider being artists. It's, it's A, you will love doing it. B, it will make you, uh, you'll be making other people happy and giving them something that will enrich their lives. And, and it's, I think it's one of the great professions to choose. You know, more and more as we go into the future, there's going to be less and less jobs. Uh, this is not necessarily bad, which it means is that people are going to be able to do more what they love rather than the toil part of, you know, the work that you hate. Machines and AI and other things are going to do that. And, and you say, well, what about the money? And, and eventually, you know, I believe this is crazy, but just like today we all pay taxes in the future, the, government, the, the state will give you will pay you the taxes because you are a citizen and you're entitled uh, because more and more non-living, what Aristotle called non-living machines are going to be doing the work, the toil. I shouldn't call it work. Work is fun. Right. And one last, I mean, we could talk for, for hours. I know we're, we're already over time, but maybe just a, a good capstone. You know, there's a lot of young people watching. It is around graduation time. You know, what, what advice would you give to them or another way to think about it? If you were them today, uh, what, yeah, what, what would you want to, to work on? What, what, what would you want to know? Well, I think this is going to, I know it's a, it, it's a tough time and people are scared about the future. I see the future, uh, even the pandemic as teaching us some good lessons that we should value as to what's really important. If you ask people today, what's really important, uh, it's that my family is okay, that the people I love are okay, that my friends are okay, that that we're we're we're. Uh, it's less. Oh, I'm going to be a billionaire. I have a new word, by the way, better than billionaire. I call it sufficient air. A sufficient air, having enough for what you need. You don't who you don't want to just pile up a lot of excess stuff. I can't believe that the so-called one percent that they talk about that have all those hundreds of billions of dollars. I can't believe that they're any happier than some really happy person there. We know, you know, thinking you're going to have money makes you happy. Anticipating having money makes you happy. Having it is a whole, those people are miserable, you know, because all they're doing is managing, worrying about losing it and stuff. That's not happiness. That's not even a smart thing to do. The smart thing to do is have a lot of friends have a lot of capability, being able to do things and, and having the freedom to be able to do it, having a great education. You should be, I think that we should go to be educating ourselves, go to school or being involved in some school thing for entire lives. I do it. I'm, I'm 81 and learning is my greatest source of pleasure. I'm reading a book right now about fungi that I, I tell you, I always take good notes when I read because I may want to remember what I, I read so many books. I don't, you know, you forget what you, what you learn. So I take good notes. I can barely get through two paragraphs of this book uh, without underlining it. So I'm underlining the whole book because when you talk about the subject of fungi, which of course is, uh, I think, I forget what that ism is called when you study that. It is so amazing that and it is so different than we think of how these networks work and how they think and uh, it is just utterly a joy to to learn something every time I, at night when I go to bed I always read before I fall asleep and I always learn so much and that's my real pleasure of life is learning and, and I would tell the young person you're talking about never stop learning never stop studying there always be learning more and more not because it's useful but because it's pleasurable I, I love that. And, and uh, as I, I consider myself a very lucky sufficient heir. So from one sufficient heir to another, thank you we're so much, Francis. We're, we're the sufficient heir class, which is, which is an honor to me because not everyone has sufficient heirness. Uh, no, but, no, but definitely. It's, it's, but if, if more people were content to be sufficient heirs instead of billionaires, then we could all be sufficient heirs. And that's the goal. That's right.
Right. That's and powerful. we wouldn't lose and, and we wouldn't lose all the individuality. I mean, there was still, you know, like I made a I made a dumb remark at people. Well, I actually didn't make the remark. I was asked at a press conference if I agreed with something one of my colleagues said that Marvel pictures were sort of uh, uh, not real cinema. And I said, of course, they're cinema. They cinema. That some of them are just made by wonderful, uh, talented people, and the ingenuity they show. But the problem is, is what the goal. And 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 in the economics that I read, there's the idea that if you make a lot of money doing things that are good for humanity, that's just. That's it's good. Like if you if you did something that just gave people a lot of pleasure or everything you're entitled to, to to be rewarded but to make money that doesn't contribute anything is despicable you know i said that not about marvel pictures i said it about just anyone who does anything that he just makes a lot of money that doesn't do any good for anyone except him i said that was despicable so the headline was Coppola thinks Marvel pictures are despicable, which I never said at all, and I don't think it's true. But boy, did I have a hassle with that one. So, because sometimes, you know, it's the headlines that argue rather than what is said. At uh, any rate, I, 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 I still do believe that. I believe that, you know, your work, if it benefits, if you, if you gain some, some wealth from it or some privilege, uh, if you, you know, as I said, my friend George Lucas, think of how many young people he made happy with the Star Wars films, what he gave to them. And I mean, besides those people, usually when they get a lot of dough, they, and he, uh, like George, he's giving it all away anyway to, for education and stuff, and, and, uh, and uh, as it should be. So, yes, be, if we were all sufficient heirs, there would be no, no, no poverty. No. Well, that's a powerful statement to end on. Well, well, thank you so much, Francis. I hope, I hope we can do this again. I'm, I'm, I'm pretty confident the entire community that's watching would love this to c continue for hours, <laughs> but thank you so much. Well, it's my pleasure and my honor. And, you know, I never have spent any time with, with students. I consider myself a student, as you know, and I never, I never uh, spe spend time with them. If I could hear them and stuff, I learn every bit as much from them as that they could possibly learn from me. And, and my respect to you, what you've invented, Sal, is, is, uh, is uh, really Im Im important uh, and wonderful help so many students get through stuff that they think they, they can't understand and you teach them that they can't understand. Well, thank you. Appreciate that so, so much. Maybe, maybe we'll do some videos together in the near future. Okay. <laughs> Ciao. Ciao. Well, well, thanks everyone for joining. As you can tell, I went way over uh, because frankly, it was just a fascinating conversation and I guess we don't really have a hard stop. I hope, I hope Francis, uh, I didn't keep him from something else, but um, as you can tell, Francis is, is the type of person that you wish you could, you know, have multiple evenings uh, chatting about pretty much any, any topic. Uh, but hopefully you enjoyed that. Uh, is it, Today is Friday already. Uh, so, and I'm actually going to be on a staycation next week. Uh, you know, people said, where are you going on your vacation? I'm like, uh, Mountain View, which is where I live. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, so we won't we won't be having the live stream next week, but uh, the week after we'll be back. Uh, so thanks, everyone, for joining and, and see you then.